Okay, um, back in May, I shared a message wherein I attempted to make the case that the thousand years of Revelation 20 is best understood as symbolic hyperbole for the 40-year period extending from Yeshua's binding of the strong man during his earthly ministry to the outbreak of the Roman Jewish War. Um, I noted that the bookend time text of Revelation more or less demand a hyperbolic approach to the thousand years. Since numeric hyperbole is a common rhetorical device used throughout the Bible to glorify Yahweh and magnify the accomplishments of his people, uh, there, would nothing, there would be nothing at all unusual about understanding the thousand years in this way. My aim here in this approach is an approach that's derived from the text and the text alone, and it reaches out to find historical circumstances that fit the text, as well as biblically used literary devices that make sense of the language of the text. And this is how, I think, Everyone should want to approach it. Our goal should not be to impose concepts and ideas upon Revelation 20 like a huge weight that are just absent in the passage itself. For example, the popular idea today that animal sacrifices will be reinstituted during the millennium. You won't find that in Revelation 20. That's the sort of thing we want to avoid. That being said, if this 40-year idea really is a textually driven approach, we should expect that there, should, there would be something within the text of Revelation 20 itself that would prompt the reader to think in terms of a 40-year period. And that's the question I'd like to focus our attention on this morning. Is there anything within the text itself that would tip the reader off to the idea that the thousand years is not only hyperbole, but hyperbole for a 40-year period specifically. In other words, does the idea of 40 years flow freely from the text? Well, if I mention the word exodus, would that tend to get you thinking in terms of 40 years? The answer is rather obvious. The exodus lasted 40 years. But wait a minute, you might say, isn't this also imposing a huge weight upon the text with a concept that just isn't there? After all, we don't exactly see the word Exodus jumping off the pages when we read Revelation chapter 20. And while that's true enough in and of itself, the chapter is literally saturated with Exodus imagery. But we don't see it today because we're reading it through modern lenses. We need to put our ancient glasses on, so to speak. It's important to remember there's a 2,000 year disconnect between us today and John's original audience back then. Revelation 20 is loaded with words and phrases that are meant to get the reader's minds thinking in terms of the Exodus. And we need to place ourselves in the position of John's first century target audience if we are going to see this. John footnotes several references to Egypt in general and the original Exodus in particular in order to telegraph the idea that what he's describing in this chapter is nothing less than the second Exodus, the new and greater Exodus inaugurated by Yeshua himself. And his first century readers would have picked up on these footnotes immediately. Now, I use the word footnotes intentionally here. Today, if a writer wants to call the reader's attention to uh, another piece of literature, a particular theme, idea, or motif, the writer will put it in a footnote, right? Or if it's a particular passage of scripture we want to reference, we typically put it in parentheses, title, chapter, and verse. For example, I'm speaking this morning on Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. 
That's how we reference it, and everyone knows exactly where to go in their Bible to find it. The New Testament writers didn't have either of these luxuries. Chapter and verse divisions weren't added to the Bible until the 13th century, and footnotes weren't even invented until the 16th century. The only ways in which New Testament writers could clue their readers in to the Old Testament passages they were drawing on was either by alluding to those passages, lifting phrases from them, or by direct quotation of small portions of those passages. And just like us today, when the New Testament writers reference an Old Testament passage, they want the readers to go back to that passage and the context of that passage in order to illuminate what they themselves are saying. Their methodology was different because they didn't have, uh, they didn't have chapter and verse divisions to reference or the ability to insert a footnote. But their intent is the same. They're expecting their readers to connect the dots. And if we miss the dots they want us to connect, we're not going to see the picture they're creating in its entirety. As Barbara Isbell comments, there are certain key texts upon which, John, upon which John relied heavily. If we're not familiar with the grand themes of books like Exodus and the Prophets, our ears will be deaf to the subtleties of John's masterful composition, and much of the book's message will be lost to us. In other words, there are things that are just invisible to us today if we miss John's verbal clues. Elizabeth Fiorenza puts it this way, Revelation, therefore, must be read and contemplated as a symphony of images if one, expects to, if one wants to experience the book's full impact. I think her symphony analogy is brilliant. As many scholars point out, the book of Revelation was originally meant to be read aloud and heard by its audience. And just like a symphony, the book of Revelation is a work of art, a masterpiece in fact, and we need to approach it as such. Having said that, you can listen to Bach being played only on a harmonica if you want to. You'll certainly get the basic tune, but you'll miss pretty much everything else. And the way in which most today approach Revelation 20 is like listening to Bach being played only on a harmonica. Everyone gets the basic tune, the basic structure. Satan the dragon is bound in the abyss for a thousand years. The saints reign with Christ during this time. And after that, Satan is briefly released and then thrown into the lake of fire. That's just the skeleton outline. The rich imagery John's using here is so much more than words filling up space on a page. They're dots waiting to be connected to events deep in the past in order to create a picture of the present for John's audience to take home with them. Excuse me. And that picture is a picture that is rich with images of Egypt and the first exodus. All of these things, the dragon, the binding, the abyss, the saints reigning with Christ, the lake of fire, and when we get to chapter 21, the phrase, no more sea. These are all intended to convey the idea that John and his readers were experiencing the new, greater, and final exodus. The biblical writers are communicating things in a different way than we do today. They're communicating these things in the only way they could at the time. When we pick up our Bible, we are entering their world and their time. We must look for their footnotes, so to speak. Every single word, every additional detail, and every subtle nuance was rich with images meant to ring bells in the minds of the readers. And John's ringing bells rather loudly here in Revelation chapter 20 in order to signal the idea that he has the new exodus in mind in this chapter. And the first of these bells is his description of Satan as a dragon in verse 2. In that verse, John uses four terms in reference to the adversary of God's people. He uses two animal names, dragon and serpent, 
and two titles, Satan and Devil. These aren't merely random terms meant to fill up space in uh, you know, a redundant manner. Each one is significant, and it's highly significant that he leads off with the term dragon. This word dragon is used 13 times in the New Testament, with all of its usages occurring exclusively by John in the book of Revelation. And by the time we get to chapter 20, our passage, John's already introduced the dragon imagery back in chapter 12 and used it extensively at this point. So the question is, do you think John wants his readers to simply forget everything he's previously said about the dragon and the way in which he introduces the imagery? Or is it more reasonable to assume that he, he expects his readers to import this information into chapter 20? The answer seems rather obvious, but again, he didn't have the ability to insert a footnote saying, see chapter 12. Again, there were no footnotes, there were no chapter and verse divisions. If he wants his readers to import the information from chapter 12 into chapter 20, the only thing he can do is give them a dot to connect. And in this case, that dot is the word dragon. With this in mind, it's widely recognized that Revelation 12 is primarily understood through the Exodus motif. Or, as G.K. Beale puts it, Revelation 12 is a replay of the Exodus pattern. And this, this is almost impossible to miss. In that chapter, a great sign appears in the sky. A woman, clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. The imagery pulls us all the way back to Genesis 37, where the sun, moon, and 11 stars represent Jacob, his wife, and 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel, who bow down to Joseph, who himself represents the 12th tribe. In other words, Joseph's vision here, and the imagery John draws on, was about his prominence in Egypt. He brings his family there, and, the, and these events precipitate what ultimately leads to the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. In verse 6, the woman John sees flees to the wilderness, to a place prepared by God, where she's nourished for 1,260 days. This calls to mind the Israelites being nourished by manna in their wilderness wanderings. With regard to this, Isbel says, the Exodus imagery in this verse alone is striking. God's faithful people, the Israelites, fled the evil dragon, Pharaoh, into the wilderness, the place appointed by God. Similarly, she continues, the wilderness in Revelation 12 is a place of refuge, of dependence upon God. John is in harmony here with the Old Testament prophets who portrayed Israel's eschatological return from captivity in terms of a new exodus. Verse 14 says that her flight to the wilderness was accomplished on the two wings of the great eagle. This would undoubtedly call John's readers' minds back to Exodus 19. When the fleeing Israelites come into the wilderness of Sinai, Yahweh says to them, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I, bore, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. In Revelation 12, 9 through, through 11, there's a war in heaven, and Satan is cast down to the earth, and a loud voice is heard in heaven celebrating this casting down. David S. Gifford notes how this expressly echoes the song of Moses and Miriam in Exodus 15. After the Lord drowned Pharaoh's uh, army in the Red Sea, dancing and tambourines spontaneously broke out, and they celebrated. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. Gifford also points out that even the very idea of a war in heaven itself takes us back to the original Exodus. In Exodus 12, 2, Yahweh's killing of the firstborn is said to be a judgment against, quote, all the gods of Egypt. 
So, in both Revelation 12 and the first Exodus, there's interplay between the earthly and divine realms. At the end of the day, the Exodus imagery that undergirds chapter 12 is just unmistakable. And it's, in, and it's within the context of this Exodus imagery that John introduces his readers to the dragon, calling him the great dragon. According to Beale, this title is meant to highlight the dragon's Egyptian character. How so, you might ask? How can Beale get the idea of Egyptian character out of the words, the great dragon? Well, Beale took the time to look up John's footnote, and that footnote would be Ezekiel 29.3. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of the streams. Beale notes that among all the Old Testament sea monster texts, and there's a lot of them, it is only here in Ezekiel 29.3 that this title is found. And in this passage, this title, the great dragon, is a direct and unequivocal reference to the Egyptian pharaoh. And while Ezekiel doesn't use the exact title, the great dragon, in chapter 32, he again takes up this pharaoh dragon connection. Son of man, raise a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, you consider yourself a lion among the nations, but you are like a dragon in the seas. And Ezekiel isn't the only prophet John's tracking on here. Isaiah likewise picks up on this Egyptian dragon idea. In Isaiah 30, verse 7, the prophet says, Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab. Rahab is among the many terms used in the Old Testament to express the dragon imagery. Isaiah 51, 9 uses both terms, dragon and Rahab, in conjunction with the Exodus. This is actually a quite common theme in the prophets. As Meredith Klein said, the use of the dragon conflict pattern for the Exodus history in poetic portions of the Bible is well known. So, John was very purposeful in his wording here, alluding to a well-known theme. In other words, he's just not throwing out random terms to spruce up the imagery. He's coloring his language in such a way that his target audience, first century believers who are familiar with this stuff, can make the conceptual connection between the dragon imagery and the Egyptian pharaoh. And he's quite literally coloring his language. In Revelation 12, 3, the verse John uses to introduce the dragon imagery, he specifies that it's a great red dragon. Beale notes that even the dragon's very color itself, red, was meant in part as further visual imagery drawing John's readers back to Egypt. How so, you might ask? Well, first, contrary to the popular belief of our day, the great red dragon is not the coronavirus created in a lab in red China. That would have meant nothing to John's original audience. But the color red did mean something to them, only it would have connected their thoughts not to modern-day China, but back to ancient Egypt. As David Ahn notes, the evil Egyptian god Seth, known in Greek mythology as Typhon, and represented variously as a snake, crocodile, and a dragon, was said to have been red in color. The negative Sethian associations with the color red are well known, according to Egyptologist Robert Rittner. He adds that red was the customary color of other demonic figures as well, such as Apophis, the enemy of Egypt's supreme deity, Ra. According to Rittner, the color red had hostile overtones and Egyptian underworld demons are even described as, quote, the red ones. In Egyptian literature, the preferred color of ink 
used to write the names of such demons and enemies is red. Geraldine Pinch, another leading uh, expert in ancient Egyptian studies, concurs. Pinch writes, the color red was associated with chaos and evil. Doing red things meant doing evil, and the names and images of chaotic forces, such as Seth or Apophis, are often written in red, while the rest of the text is in black. Considering the negative connotations of the color red in the Egyptian mindset, it's ironically quite fitting, then, that Pharaoh and his armies should have drowned in a body of water known as the Red Sea. Putting all of this together, Dr. Stephen Ray Coy notes how obvious the connection would have been to John's original audience. He writes, <clears throat> when John introduced the appearance of the dragon in heaven, he significantly added the word red. It is the great red dragon. Because of the long tradition in the Jewish community, readers would immediately know. This is a subtle way of using a symbol but clear enough for sensitive readers or listeners to understand. Coy continues, John is, preventing, John is presenting images and symbols creating an exodus environment for the Asian Christians, similar to the time of Moses. In other words, a nuance like this is not going to be lost on John's original audience like it is on us today. Thus, we can read terms like the great dragon and a great red dragon, but if we don't take the time to connect the dots that John wants us to connect, if we don't take the time to look up his footnotes, we're just listening to Bach being played only on a harmonica. We get the basic tune, but we miss the full impact of everything that's really going on in the passage. There are layers of meaning that are just lost to us today when we fail to make these connections. In short, the dragon language of Revelation 12 is Egyptian imagery embedded in a second Exodus passage. And we made the point earlier that it's rather obvious that John would expect his readers to import the information about the dragon from chapter 12 where he introduces the imagery into his final usage of the imagery here in Revelation 20. It would just seem absurd to think otherwise. You know, he's, he's not rebooting the imagery every time he mentions it. But again, he didn't have the ability to insert a footnote saying, see chapter 12. There were no footnotes, no chapter and verse divisions. If he wants his readers to import the information from chapter 12 into chapter 20, the only thing he can do is give them a dot to connect. And as stated previously, the dot in this case is the word dragon. So I think the first connection to Egypt and the Exodus is rather clear. When John, re when John uses the word dragon to describe Satan, he's expecting lights to go off in his listeners' heads. Lights that will illuminate the fact that he has the second Exodus in mind by drawing their thoughts back to Egypt, back to Pharaoh, and back to the first exodus. Now, that's not to say Satan was Pharaoh or Pharaoh was Satan, but it is to say that Satan was the dark force behind Pharaoh's actions. And just like Satan needed to be bound before God's people could make the first exodus, so he needed to be bound once again before the second exodus could commence. Now, wait a minute, you might say, when was Satan bound before the first exodus? I've never read that before in my Bible. Well, that's a fair question to ask today, but a first century, a first century reader probably wouldn't have asked that question. Remember, there is a 2,000 year disconnect between us today and John's original audience back then. If you're a first century Christian, Revelation 20 is not gonna be the first time you've read about the binding and imprisonment of an evil being. You would have read it before in Jubilees 48 through 15, 48, 15 through 16. And on the 14th day, 
and on the 15th, and on the 16th, and on the 17th, and on the 18th, the Prince Mastema was bound and in prison behind the children of Israel that he might not accuse them. And on the 19th, we let them loose that they might help the Egyptians and pursue the children of Israel. So, in the book of Jubilees, there is a binding of an evil being, Prince Mastema, and it happens in conjunction with the Exodus. Now, Jubilees is part of the Pseudepigrapha. I think I said that right. Uh, books that were written during the Second Temple period. Specifically, Jubilees was written during the intertestamental phase, the time that bridges the gap between uh, Malachi and Matthew. Jubilees is a retelling of the events in Genesis and Exodus, and it provides additional information not contained in those books, like the binding of Mastema at the time of the Exodus. Our first instinct today is probably to discount this additional information as fictitious and assume the New Testament writers would have done so as well. But we shouldn't be so quick in that assumption. Take, for example, Stephen, Acts chapter 7. Stephen's recounting Israel's history, and he makes this statement in verses 13 through 17. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come with him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. And from there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money. So according to Stephen, Jacob and all his relatives were laid in the tomb purchased by Abraham. Now, we know from Genesis 50 that Jacob was buried there, but that's all it says. Genesis 50 doesn't mention anything about any of his relatives being there, buried there as well. And you'll search the book of Genesis in vain, trying to find out where Stephen got this information. That's because Stephen isn't using the traditional Genesis text here. He's using the book of Jubilees. Jubilees 46.9 states, And the children of Israel brought forth all the bones of the children of Jacob, except the bones of Joseph, and they buried them in the field in the double cave in the mountain. This is just one example among many, but it makes the point. Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit at this time, according to Acts 7.55, was not only familiar with the book of Jubilees, with the book of Jubilees, but he accepted and utilized material from it. And Stephen wasn't the only one. Father Stephen Day Young of Ancient Faith Ministries has an excellent online article simply titled The Book of Jubilees, where he demonstrates how Jubilees is referenced in some of the writings of Peter and Paul and even by Jesus himself in the Gospels. And this just, this just shows how far removed we are from the first generation of Christians who allowed Second Temple literature, like the Book of Jubilees, to shape their thinking and inform their understanding. This does not mean Jubilees is scripture, as Christopher Carlson reminds us, but it does indicate that the early Christians found it useful enough to use as source material for their writings. With this in mind then, the similarities between Jubilees 48 and Revelation 20 are just unmistakable. There are three clear contextual points of contact. In both places, there's a binding and loosing of an evil being, followed by an attack on God's people. In Jubilees, the name of this evil being is Prince Mastema. According to DDD, Mastema is a noun meaning hostility. And it's used that way in Hosea 9, for example. In later literature, the word takes on the meaning of the angel of hostility. And in the Qumran scrolls, the word is mostly connected with the evil angel Belial. In Jubilees, Mastema is always the proper name for the leader of the evil angels. 
According to Michael Heiser, the word mastema itself is linguistically related to the Hebrew hasatan, or Satan. Mastema is the prince of demons, and he's identified with Satan in Jubilees 10. In Jubilees, the demons do everything Mastema tells them, and he exercises authority over mankind. In short, Mastema is the figure, is the figure we know in the New Testament as Satan. These things being the case, John's mention of Satan being bound in Revelation 20 would, would have certainly taken his readers' minds back to Jubilees 48 and the binding of Mastema or Satan at the time of the original Exodus. If Mastema or Satan is going to be bound again, this would undoubtedly signal that a new Exodus was taking place. And this is the key takeaway here. Biblical scholar Lori Guy unpacks all of this for us and makes the connection between the millennium and the new Exodus. Guy writes, Exodus Satan type connections predated Revelation by a couple of centuries at least. This is evident in the book of Jubilees, within which the Exodus story is thickened by the presence of a Satan type figure, Prince Mastema, who is the shadowy force behind the Egyptians' actions. Mastema is bound for several days so that the Israelites can successfully despoil the Egyptians and then release to assist the Egyptians to pursue the Israelites prior to the Egyptians and apparently Mastema also being thrown into the middle of the sea, the depths of the abyss. Guy continues, the millennium has a deep connection with events that have already taken place. And he concludes by stating, the Exodus thus seems to be a template for the Revelation 20 storyline. Guy's observations are spot on. And John's readers would have picked up on the fact that Satan's binding inaugurated the new and final Exodus. And this binding or overpowering of Satan is in perfect, in this binding or overpowering of Satan in conjunction with the Exodus, I meant to say, is in perfect keeping with what other New Testament writers were telegraphing to their readers. In Matthew's Gospel, we're all familiar with this, Yeshua binds the strong man. In Luke, he overpowers him. Two different ways of saying the same thing. If our observations are about Jubilees 48 are correct, Matthew's binding language would echo the binding of Mastema at the time of the Exodus. But if the Exodus really is the point of the language, then Luke would have to do something else to convey the Exodus theme, since he chooses the word overpowers instead of the word binds. So, does Luke do it? Does he make the Exodus connection? Indeed, he does. And the next change of language is significant in this regard. In Matthew's version of the account, Yeshua says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke's wording is exactly the same, with one minor or perhaps major difference. He says, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke replaces the word spirit with the word finger. And this seemingly subtle change is, in reality, his own explicit way of linking Yeshua's overpowering of Satan with the Exodus idea. The finger of God is an idiom meant to take Luke's readers all the way back to Egypt and the original Exodus. In Exodus 8:19, after Pharaoh's magicians couldn't duplicate the miracles performed by Aaron, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. As Samuel Rutznitz writes, when Jesus describes his power over the demons as the finger of God, he's recalling imagery from the Exodus narrative. Daryl Bach puts it this way, the allusion to the finger of God 
points to a formative era like the Exodus, since the allusion is to Exodus 8.19. This formative era, like the Exodus, is the new and greater Exodus that Yeshua himself was inaugurating. Yeshua's casting out of demons by the finger of God means that he has in fact bound the strong man. Just as Prince Mastema was bound before the first Exodus and the long-awaited new Exodus had finally begun. The binding and overpowering of Satan has its roots in the Book of Jubilees and links John's language to the Exodus traditions in perfect harmony with both Matthew and Luke. So John's usage of the term dragon and the idea of Satan being bound can both be linked back to Egypt and or the Exodus. But what about the abyss? Is there an Exodus connection there? According to Lori Guy, there definitely is. Further Exodus 20 linkage, Exodus Revelation 20 linkage occurs, writes Guy, with Satan being cast into the abyss. Indeed, the very place where Pharaoh and his armies drowned is conceptually connected to the realm where Satan is bound. We've already looked at Isaiah 51, 9 through 10, but let's look at it once more. Was it not you who cut Rahab into pieces, who pierced the dragon? Notice, once again, the dragon language in conjunction with the Exodus. Then Isaiah says, Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the pass of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? The word translated great deep in the ESV is abyss, the same word John uses in Revelation 20. We see the same thing going on in Psalm 77. Your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep, the abyss, trembled. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Commenting on this passage, Lori Guy says, Clearly, Psalm 77 connects the abyss with the Exodus and the Red Sea crossing. And this linkage is patent, he continues, in Psalm 106.9, which reads, Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders, they did not remember your abundant kindness, but they rebelled by the sea, at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for the sake of his name, so that he might make his power known. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up, and he led them through the deep, through the abyss, as through the wilderness. Hence, continues Guy, references in Revelation 20 to the dragon and the abyss significantly call the Exodus event to mind. As the dragon Pharaoh drowned in the abyss, allowing the Israelites to make the first Exodus, the dragon Satan is trapped in the abyss, allowing the new Israel, God's people from all nations, to make the final Exodus. So, we can clearly see that three of our terms so far have very strong connections to the original Exodus. And the next dot to connect is just, it's just impossible to miss for anybody. It's almost self-evident. Um, just as those who made the first Exodus were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Exodus 19.6, so those saints who rule and reign with Christ during the millennium are called the priests of God. Uh, again, this connection is far less subtle to our you know, modern eyes and uh, just about everybody gets it. For example, J. Casey Smith misses the first three connections that Lori Guy makes that we've reviewed, but he clearly makes the connection here, calling it, quote, the first use of Exodus typology in the final sequence of visions. According to Casey, the priestly vocation of believers in Revelation 26 is the fulfillment of Exodus 19, 5 through 6. My point here is simply that, you know, this connection to the Exodus 
is so obvious it hardly uh, you know, even requires proof. Someone who misses all the previous Exodus connections up to this point finally gets it here. For us, it simply builds on what we've already observed. John is constantly and continually taking his readers back to Egypt and back to the original Exodus event. So the term dragon, the language of binding, the abyss, and the priestly reign of believers all connect back to Egypt and back to the Exodus. And next, the place of Satan's final demise is cast in distinctly Egyptian terminology so that his audience can't possibly miss this connection as we miss it today. In Revelation 20.10, the devil is thrown into the lake of fire, which is later called the second death. And as many scholars note, this phrase is found nowhere else in either the New Testament or the Hebrew Bible, and this, this tends to baffle them. As David On writes, the image is problematical, for there are no close parallels in the Old Testament Jewish literature or in Greco-Roman literature, particularly when the place of eternal punishment is conceived of as a lake. Justin Bass hints at this problem when he easily surveys the history of various New Testament afterlife terms such as paradise, Abraham's bosom, the abyss, Tartarus, Hades, and Gehenna, but then makes this interesting comment, it's more difficult to track down the origin of the imagery behind the lake of fire in Revelation. According to David Woodington, this phrase, the lake of fire, is unique to John himself with the lone exception of a few temporally distant Egyptian sources. And again he writes, besides a handful of extremely old Egyptian sources, the precise conception of a lake of fire remains unique to John. David On concurs. Surprisingly, he says, the image of a lake of fire occurs in ancient Egyptian texts, like the Book of the Dead, where it is located in the underworld. Though the channel of transmission from Egypt to Revelation is unknown, says On, it's instructive to note that another Egyptian underworld myth the second death is not only associated with the lake of fire in Revelation, but also found closely connected with the lake of fire in the Egyptian book of the dead. On continues, the ultimate Egyptian origin of this concept in Greek, Christian, and later Jewish literature is supported by the pairing of the notions of the second death and the lake of fire in Revelation 20 and 21, which also occurs in the Egyptian text. So, the lake of fire, coupled with the other term, the second death, is found only here in Revelation and some ancient Egyptian writings. According to On, for the Egyptians, this second death in the lake of fire was, quote, a fate to be avoided at all costs. Again, the book of Revelation is a work of art, and what John's doing here in Revelation chapter 20 is artistically brilliant. To cast Satan's final demise in noticeably Egyptian terminology, the lake of fire, makes perfect sense if, in fact, John is seeking to make a theological point, drawing his readers all the way back to Egypt. Just as Mastema, through Pharaoh, attempted to prevent the Israelites from making the first exodus. So now Satan sought to prevent people from all nations from making the new and greater exodus out of Satan's kingdom of darkness and deception and into Christ's kingdom of light and truth. As the dragon figure in Revelation, Satan takes on the role of the ancient Egyptian Pharaoh who would seek to prevent this final exodus. Thus, it's only fitting that his ultimate downfall is cast in terms of the worst fate possible in the Egyptian mind, an eternity in the lake of fire. 
to miss what David on calls the ultimate Egyptian origin of this concept is to miss the brilliant irony of what John's attempting to telegraph to his readers in this passage. It is once again to hear only the basic tune, but to miss the full symphony of instruments being played. And the grand finale of John's new Exodus symphony comes in the next verse, or comes in the next chapter, sorry, wherein he describes a new heaven and new earth wherein there is no more sea. Unfortunately, modern dispensationalists totally miss the significance of this phrase and think God's going to create a very dry planet someday. According to Michael Hoodman of gotquestions.org, there is no reason not to take this literally. God's, God's new earth will not contain vast areas of salt water spanning the, spanning the globe. <laughs> this may be disturbing to those who love the sea, he informs us, but we cannot twist the verse's meaning just to make ourselves feel more comfortable. He assures us the new earth will have a different geography and a different climate. And I didn't want to chuckle through that, but I couldn't help myself. My apologies. Anyway, uh, contrary to Hoodman, there is every reason not to take this literally. As Ken Gentry writes, but if we understand this literally, it makes no theological sense. Why would the sea not be part of the new eternal creation order? Did not God recreate the new earth? Why would he also why would he not also recreate the sea? Did not God create and bind the sea at the original creation? And is this not a feature of God's creative work, which is very good? Gentry continues, nor does it make any contextual sense. For what becomes of the river that flows through the city? Does it evaporate? Does it make a complete endless circle around the globe? Rivers naturally and necessarily end into a pool of some sort, such as a lake, sea, or ocean. Besides, Scripture can speak metaphorically by employing the drying up of the sea as when God judges Old Testament Babylon. Why could not this sea absence also be metaphorical? The literalistic approach is unworkable and unnecessary in Amen, Dr. Gentry. Gentry makes an excellent point here about the drying of the sea being used metaphorically. As he says, Jeremiah describes the judgment of Babylon in precisely these terms, and I will dry up her sea and make her fountains dry. Isaiah picks up on this same idea, where the metaphorical drying of the sea is parallel to the actions of the Persian king Cyrus. It is I who says of the depths of the sea, be dried up and I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my good desire. This is a Hebrew poetic parallel where the drying up of the sea and the actions of Cyrus in Jerusalem's restoration are one in the same. As Golden Gay and Payne point out in their commentary on Isaiah, the poetic words and prosaic words are commonly used in parallelism as here in verse 27. There is no presupposition that the deep and its waters have any literal connection with water. They don't. We see the same thing going on in Psalm 144 verse 7. Stretch out your hand from on high, rescue me and deliver me from the many waters from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lies. The many waters are the foreigners whose mouths speak lies. Again, dispensationalists totally miss the point of the imagery in passages like this. For an Israelite, the past gives shape and meaning to the present and the future. And the waters of the sea becomes a metaphor for the hostile and evil powers which oppose God's people. It's drying up recalls the original Exodus event and symbolically represents the defeat 
or downfall of the powers currently opposing God's people. This is most clearly seen in Psalm 18, a psalm of David about his deliverance from the hand of Saul. David poetically describes his deliverance in the following manner. Then the channels of the waters appeared, and the foundations of the world were exposed. By your rebuke, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he saved me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me. The literal historical narrative of David's deliverance from the hand of Saul is recorded in 1 Samuel 19 in the following chapters. You can read those chapters over and over again, and you'll not find one reference to the channels of the waters appearing, the foundation of the world being exposed, or David being drawn out of many waters. This is poetry. David's recalling Moses' deliverance out of the waters and likening it to his own deliverance from the hand of Saul. In the Old Testament, the removal of the sea is an image from the past meant to give shape and meaning to the present and near future. John's doing the same thing here in Revelation. John's usage of the sea, writes Dave Mathewson, functions within Revelation's discourse to contribute an additional element in the new Exodus motif. The removal of the sea, continues Mathewson, functions as the climax of an important canonical theme. The sea of chaos and affliction, which opposed God and threatened His people, which God has repeatedly subdued, is now judged in a new creative act at the climax of God's prophetic revelation. But this time, it's eliminated forever. All that is left is for God's people to enjoy God's presence in unending security. More than signifying some change in the geographical landscape, the removal of the sea expresses the hope of God's people in the final removal of all things that threaten and hinder them from the full experience of salvation. Marilyn Harris puts it this way, unlike the first creation, unlike the world after the flood, and unlike Israel in the promised land, this new world is eternally secure to the extent that chaos and evil are utterly powerless and unable to even threaten the communion of God and His people. Michael Morales puts it this way, Indeed, when the Bible story closes with the declaration that in the new earth there was no more sea, the point is theological, poetically referring to the absence of evil powers rather than topographical or geological. In the second Exodus context, these evil powers were the false gods of the other nations. They were the chaotic they were the chaotic forces that enslaved the people of those nations. Remember, Paul told the Ephesians their struggle was not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities in the heavenly places. Yeshua came to liberate the people and eliminate the evil powers. That's what the new Exodus was all about. And this new Exodus theme permeates Revelation chapter 20 beginning with the dragon language in verse 2 and culminating in 21.1 where we are told there is no more sea. This is the picture we get if we connect all the dots. It's the song the symphony's playing. John's using visual imagery to give believers in Asia Minor a mental picture to take home with them. A mental picture that would embed in their minds the fact that they were experiencing and embarking upon the long-awaited new exodus. Having said that, and this is the key point, if the first exodus only lasted 40 years, do we really believe it's taken 50 times as long, 2,000 years, and we're still in a state of exodus? Do we really believe that Yeshua, the new and greater Moses, has not taken his people to the promised land 
of the new heavens and new earth. He has. And we're not in the millennium now. We're not waiting for the millennium to start. The exodus is over. Yeshua and his first century followers did their job. They got us there. And we need to stop living and thinking like we're still in a state of exodus and realize this is Yahweh's world now. And this is why this is so important. With a proper understanding of what the millennium was all about, the final exodus, we can have a proper understanding of what we're supposed to be all about. Namely, impacting this world for Christ on the earthly side of the new heavens and new earth. Just as Adam and Eve were his image bearers in the original creation, we are his image bearers in the new creation. We need to know who we are and where we are on God's timetable. It affects how we live and how we view our mission in this world. And that's why I think it's so important to understand that the thousand years of Revelation 20 were symbolic hyperbole for that 40-year transition period. We're not in the transition period anymore. We are His image bearers in the new creation. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that You would grant us wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and guidance, Father God. Lord, I pray this, that this, uh, this message that I shared, what I, what I felt was laid on my heart, Father God, would be a blessing to the extent where I was accurate, Father God, and um, to the extent where I wasn't, Lord, I ask that you would help me and all the listeners to um, delve further into your word and the path to the truth, Father God. I thank you for this time of fellowship. I thank you for these wonderful Bereans that are here with me and for all those watching at home. Uh, amen. <clears throat>